Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Give a Damn. I'm Nick LaPara, and I'm super pumped that you're here spending the next hour or so of your time with me. I don't take that lightly, so thank you very much for being here. We have a great conversation queued up for you with Justin Jones. Justin and I just wrapped up our conversation a few minutes ago. He left to go attend a transportation meeting with the mayor of Nashville, and I'm recording this intro for you. A little bit about Justin before we begin. Justin Jones is an activist, a community organizer, and he is running for Congress in Tennessee's 5th Congressional District. While in high school in Oakland, California, Justin began growing into an activist and a real damn giver. He served as the city's youth commissioner, and he successfully recalled city council members that weren't doing their jobs. He then went on to get his undergrad at Fisk University here in Nashville, where he received the John R. Lewis Scholarship for Social Activism. He's now doing grad work at Vanderbilt University focused on spirituality and social activism. He has chaired the Nashville Student Organizing Committee, and he is the recipient of multiple awards from the Tennessee Human Rights Commission, the ACLU of Tennessee, the Tennessee Alliance for Progress, Fisk University Alumni Association, the Vanderbilt Organization of Black Graduate Students, and the Nashville NAACP. I'm only telling you about a few of the things that he has done for the sake of time. But Justin is amazing. Oh, also, he's been arrested several times for protesting injustices and fighting for the rights of others. And did I mention that Justin is only 24 years old? I just met Justin today for the first time after following him online for quite some time, and I already look up to him in so many ways. Before we begin, I want to point out that I space out a few times during our chat. You may not notice it, but I did. While recording with Justin... I was fighting a massive migraine and a face-melting sinus infection. Consequently, my words and ideas didn't come out well at times. Not an excuse, just an explanation. And since I'm recording this intro right after our conversation, I'm still experiencing that massive migraine and face-melting sinus infection. Anyway, friends, let's get right into it, shall we? This is Let's Give a Damn Podcast, and here's my conversation with Justin Jones. Let's go. Okay, let's get going. Justin Jones, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Appreciate you for having me here. Yeah, I'm so excited. I first saw you, which we'll get to, I first saw you pop up in my Twitter timeline a while back because you were uh, causing a ruckus um, <laughs> with a certain uh, representative. And so we'll, we'll get to that. But that was my first introduction. I saw you in some photos. You were at a table talking to some people. And I, I want you to explain all of that. But um, I'm, I'm really interested. There's so many things that I want to talk about. You are a young, budding politician in, in a time when it's not, I don't think it's ever been popular to be a politician, but in this time when it's especially being scrutinized and uh, you're, you're choosing to jump in. And so there's so much that I want to talk about. I want to encourage young people today uh, in this very volatile age of politics that we're in, you're choosing to jump in instead of run away. And so I'm very excited to explore that with you. But first, let's get to know you a little bit because most people I would venture don't know anything about you. And I know very little about you, even though I've read up and, you know, uh, done a little bit of research for this conversation. But let's get to know the Justin Jones. Like, how did you become who you are today? So you're born in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, was born in Oakland, California, Um, came to Fisk University for undergraduate to study political science. And um, I think one thing that I would start by saying about myself is that I come from a um, black and Filipino household, a household in which my first teachers in theology and in justice and in compassion were my grandmothers on both sides. And mm. so um, I come from black working class fam- family from the south side of Chicago and Filipino immigrants um, from the mountains and Cagayan in the Philippines. And so I grew up hearing stories about um, what my family went through and, you know, kind of learning stories about my grandmother left the Philippines when we had a dictator in the Philippines who um, was oppressing our people and hearing stories about that, but also hearing my family, why they left the South to go to Chicago, then eventually to California, um, seeking opportunity, fleeing from that terrorism of Jim Crow. And so it's been it's been really interesting to, to see now that I found myself back in the South, you know, um, back in Tennessee, where my family came from before going to Chicago. And um, I remember when I came from California to Tennessee to go to Fisk, the first thing my aunt told me when I was getting on the plane, she said, Justin, don't cause any trouble in Tennessee Mm. um, because it's not the same as where you're from. Um, Because in high school, you know, I got involved in community organizing work. Um, I was 17 years old when Trayvon Martin was killed 
you know, he was also 17. That was my first um, organizing work in Oakland where we organized students in, in high schools to protest at the federal building to show our power and to show our outrage and our righteous indignation at what was happening. Um, and then came to Tennessee, spent my first semester at Fish just trying to be a regular student, staying involved in school, um, just listening to what my aunt said. And then eventually... Um, realized that there's some really messed up stuff happening here. And so the first issue that I got involved with was um, organizing demonstrations and coordinating a federal lawsuit against Tennessee's voter ID law um, that makes it easier to get a gun in Tennessee than it is for college students to vote. That was passed in 2013. It's, it's crazy. Um, and so we filed a federal lawsuit against them. We protested them. We testified. We filed legislation. Um, and it all fell on deaf ears. And so that's kind of was seven years ago. And ever since then have, have seen that um, we have a lot of extremists at the legislature who need to be challenged, who need to be held accountable. And so that's kind of what got me involved in this work. So Yeah, so let's back up a little bit. So Oakland, California, growing up there in the, I guess, late 90s, because you're 24. Yeah. Uh, so late 90s. Uh, what was that like? Because, I mean, people, when they think, if anybody knows about the Bay Area, yeah. San Francisco versus Oakland, like it's it, it's pretty rough, right? Or it was back then. I guess it's probably being pretty gentrified now. Yeah. Or did you or did you see it as rough? What, did you grow up thinking it was rough? No, so I was born in Oakland, moved to Richmond. Um, I don't know if you, you saw Richmond. That's where um, Bernie had a big rally yesterday and yep. then I moved to the East Bay. And so I kind of grew up in the whole Bay Area, like, you know, catching bar, catching, you know, had friends from all around. I was a part of the Oakland NAACP um, until I came here to Fisk. And so um, I think one thing that Oakland taught me is that Oakland has a rich legacy of, of folks who spoke truth to power. It's where the Black Panther Party was founded. It's where um, Representative Barbara Lee comes from, who's the only representative to vote against the Iraq war. Um, Oakland has mm. a history of, of, of kind of being ahead of its time. Um, we also have some really good sports teams in Oakland. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think Oakland, what the Bay Area showed me is that um, it kind of gave me a different metric of, of what is possible. Um, it showed me that you know, what people power looks like. You know, we in Richmond, you have a Chevron refinery there. So you had people organizing the Richmond Progressive Alliance to, to take over the city council, saying that we don't have to allow Chevron to hijack our city, that people can have power. Um, and then when I was in Hercules, um, it was the first time that I saw people power was working on a recall election where we recalled our city council members for not doing what was right, for engaging in financial impropriety. And we were able to recall them. And oh, so wow. I, I grew up seeing... How old were you when that happened? I was a sophomore in high school okay. and was out collecting signatures, trying to recall these city council members. So let's... So there's so much here. You were a kid when, when most kids are, I mean, just fucking around, just not doing much of good typically right they're they're playing video games they're kind of messing around just trying to get by right most kids you are collecting signatures to recall city council men and women right that weren't doing their job was it more your you talked about your your legacy and your your relatives and you know you have a very rich legacy coming from you know uh escaping dictatorship in the Philippines, right? Mm -hmm. And then coming from the South, like very, you, you have fighters, right? You have fighter in your blood. Was it more relatives or was it Oakland, which you're pointing out has quite a rich legacy of being ahead of its time and opposing evil and wrongdoing? Was it was it kind of a 50-50 there between those two? Or how did you, because I'm sure there's lots of people in Oakland in your, in your upbringing that don't give a damn, that don't care about those things. They just kind of live their life and turn a blind eye to the things that are happening. So what was it different that in high school, when most kids are, you know, trying things out and doing this and doing that and wasting time generally outside of school, you were trying to recall city council men and women that weren't doing their jobs. Like, how did that happen? I think it was a combination of them. I remember another transformative mo moment in Oakland that I always remember where I did, you saw a community take action, collective action was during Occupy. Oakland shut down the fifth largest port in the nation. And so I remember telling my mom, my mom's a member of the nurses union, so the unions were participating, but that I was skipping school to go to this general strike where the whole city shut down. Businesses, um, the port workers, the dock workers refused to unload anything because they said we need to shut down business as normal in our community in solidarity with the national um, Occupy movement. So I think it was a combination, but also, um, you know, of the spirit of, of this place that I was, I grew up in, but also of my family. Like, I mean, I grew up realizing as the oldest sibling, as the oldest cousin, I mean, my family that you have obligation for those who are coming after you. And so um, I just, that stuck with me. I don't know what, if it was one more than the other. Um, I remember in high school, like just seeing, I went to Hercules High School, seeing the power of, of, of speaking out where, you know, I ended up boycotting my high school graduation. I didn't go to graduation. I didn't go to prom because we had an administration that was so complicit in the school to prison pipeline that was so, you know, 
complicit in, in trying to silence the sin on campus of teachers and students who are outspoken. And so I saw that as like another sort of call to action. So I, I, I attributed it to my grandmothers and to teachers in high school who are willing to speak, speak up and uplift us and not beat us down when others were telling us that we just need to slow down, just be quiet and just to go along to get along. So. So in 2013, you come to Tennessee, yeah. to Fisk University. Uh, why why Fisk? Why Tennessee? Because of your relatives used to be here or great opportunity or scholarship or what was it? Yeah, so I had no idea that my family history came from Tennessee okay. when I came here until I started asking my great-grandmother who passed away a few years ago more questions about our history. Um, and I just thought that was another, you know, Cairo's moment to be here in this time. But I, I wanted to go to HBCU, and so um, I, I toured some schools because I knew that when I went to undergraduate, there would be problems, but I didn't want my race to be one of them. Growing up in the Bay Area, I never was a minority in an academic setting. Um, you know, I didn't experience that until now at graduate school at Vanderbilt. But at Fisk, I really loved the history. I loved the legacy. Um, Fisk was small enough to know your name, yet large enough to meet your needs. Um, and, it, you know, just was a, the right place to be at the right time. Um, and, and, you know, finishing there a couple years ago really confirmed that. So you, at what point, uh, so 2013, that is six years ago, seven now, depending on when you came, um, you come here for school. At what point do you decide um, that you want to get involved in the messy game, the messy business that is uh, politics? Definitely. I think at Fisk, one of the most interesting things is that you cannot go through Fisk without learning about our civil rights history. So you always hear about John Lewis, W.B. Du Bois, yep. Diane Nash, those who were there. And it's just interesting to me that we learned so much about our history. And then at what point do we continue that history? And so I remember when I turned 18, I was so excited to register to vote here in, in Tennessee. Um, I had been excited to be able to vote, you know, was active civically. And so I was registered to vote and then learned about this extreme regressive voter ID law that I was speaking about where you ha cannot use your student ID cards to vote anymore. That was passed in 2012 here in Tennessee. And so I was like, this is crazy. And so I started talking to other students on campus about it saying, you know, like most of us couldn't vote because we couldn't afford a passport. You know, you, you don't have a water bill, utility bill yep. to prove your residency. Yep. And so we start challenging that and talking to more students about that. And so that was the first issue we got involved with. Went to the legislature to kind of just, you know, hear what was the reasoning behind this. Started, you know, meeting with lawmakers and talking to them. And then realized the legislature was not used to people who look like me, young people of color, coming up there and challenging them. If you go to the legislature, it is a lot of white men in suits. That is what is the norm there. And so when you start going, you really disrupt that space, um, even just your presence. And so we filed a bill with the um, one of the Black Caucus members and I testified before the legislature and it was just it was an hour testimony and it was just the most eye opening experience where you had these, you know, representatives like Representative Durham, Rep Representative Matthew Hill really trying to beat you down, saying, you know, that you don't know what you're talking about when you know what the facts are, that in fact, the voter ID law will decrease voter turnout, that there, that there are no instances of voter fraud in Tennessee with identification, very minimal. And so this law was, in fact, voter fraud in itself. That was fraudulent passing this law after you had the highest turnout of young voters in a generation in 2008. They said, oh, now we don't want young people voting as much. And so they passed this law. How many students were being affected by or it's tens of thousands, I imagine? Like, do you, do you have a number? Of hundreds of thousands. Yes. Um, they said in Tennessee, twenty-five percent of people would be impacted because not just students, but you had senior citizens yeah. who didn't have IDs. All, all kinds of people that didn't have IDs people for a variety of reasons. Yeah. yeah, and so this was passing that voter suppression wave that happened after you know the repeal of the Voting Rights Act um, by the Supreme Court overturning Section Four, and so you had this whole wave of voter suppression because they they think that that's the only way that they can win and hold power. And so that was just like a very disturbing, troubling experience. And also realizing, you know, spiritually what it took in the South to get the vote, how mm. that blood of those who, you know, in Tennessee who risked their lives for us to vote. You go over to West Tennessee, you had people put out of their farms, put in Tent City in Haywood County in Brownsville just for trying to vote. And then you have the same lawmakers here saying we want to take this nation back and they're taking us back to a town we don't want to go to. So I think that's, you know, something we had to call out. What are the main motivations? Like what, what would motivate them? to take away this right for people to vote, people that don't have the right ID. What is the motivation behind that? What we've been able to show is that there was fear after 2012, 20, 2008, where you had this fusion of young people, of people of color. You know, you, you have demographics changing, and so they're trying to find ways to suppress those people from turning out because, you know, in, in 20, 2008, you had the highest turnout since the 26th Amendment was passed that lowered the voting age to 18 from 21. And you had this, you know, huge 49% youth voter turnout. And now they're saying, oh, we have an issue with that. And, you know, the only way that this turnout happened was because of fraud. And then the, in the other argument they said is, well, you shouldn't be voting where you go to college. You should vote in your home state. Where if you look at the Supreme Court case of Sim United States that was passed, 
college students have the right to vote where they go to college. You know, you can choose. That's your residency because that's where you feel is home. And so, like, for me, I've been here, for, you know, for seven years, going on seven years now. And so this is my community. And so I pay taxes here. We should have the right to vote here. And the Supreme Court agreed with us. And they found this roundabout way to try and stop that. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that in Nashville we have so many universities and colleges. Yeah, right. That they don't they don't want to participate in in the electoral process because it means them losing power and losing their sort of you know oppressive hold on on what they think is at risk of lose they're at risk of losing. So there's a huge conversation happening around lowering the voting age to 16. I assume you're in favor of that or no or what do you think about that? Do you think it should be younger or do you not have an opinion? Yeah, I think. I think at the time that we're in now, you see young people taking a lead and you see yeah. young people who are going to be disproportionately impacted by the decisions happening. For example, the climate crisis. Yep. Like if we don't take to action in 10 years, there is such a thing as being too late. There's a clock running. And so I think that people who even, you know, running as a young person, you often hear young people, you have so much to learn. You need to slow down. You know, you're not ready. But you look at the people making the decisions today and young people are much more informed than them. Look at who's running our country. Look at who's running our state legislature. And, and then you see, you know, who is really disconnected and, and does not have the experience necessary to to inform the decision making process. So yeah, last evening on Facebook you shared these following words. You said we need less of the same pundits and political strategists speculating what's possible, realistic or what's viable or who's viable, and more young people given the giving the platform to share what they want because at the end of the day it's their future on the line. It's our future on the line. This is not a game. It's personal. You're young. You're 24. So that's why I was kind of asking that because I think maybe 20 years ago, there were a lot of people, young people that didn't give a shit. They didn't care. They're, they weren't involved. They weren't marching. They weren't rising up. And now you have the Parkland students. You have Greta Thunberg. You have these young people that are, by every metric, speaking more intelligently and uh, leading better than so many of the older people, old people, that <laughs> – it, does, it, w it won't matter as much to them because they're going to be dead and gone when these problems actually rear their ugly heads, when they come to fruition. Our climate crisis is one of them, but there's so many others where they're going to be gone. And so it's it's wrong. It's evil of them to not care, even though they're not going to be around for it. But that's just the reality. So many of them don't seem to give a shit yeah. because they're going to be long gone. Short-sighted. Yeah, yeah, very short-sighted. Yeah. And so that's why I was asking, like, I do think – um, I, and I, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm missing some things, but by and large, I think, yeah, 16 year olds should, cause they care more. This is maybe the first generation that really, really, really does care. Part of it might be unhealthy, right? We have unhealthy. And here's what I mean by that. We have more knowledge at our disposal than ever before. We have more, these young kids that didn't know about, what happens behind closed doors. They didn't have a peek into what's happening in, in legislative meetings, in Capitol buildings, right? You know, you've been caught on, you know, years ago, caught on video, you know, pushing back at the powers that be like, they didn't have access to that before, but now that they're seeing, we, we just have so much being thrown at us on social media and otherwise that again, for better or for worse, this passion has been awakened inside of young people and they want to do something about it. For sure. And I, the reason I wrote that was because, you know, our campaign, one of the things that we've been trying to uplift is young people. And what we keep being told is that we're too radical. We need to slow down. We don't have the experience. We don't, you know, understand how the system works. And I think that is just so insulting because the same people who berate young people for saying you don't turn out to vote when we do get involved, then they yep. criticize how we get involved. And I think the truth is, is that... As you said, many of these young people are going to feel the consequences of these decisions that people, you know, the average age in Congress is, is over 60 right now. Half the people will Insane. not be here in, in, in a generation. And so it is us who will inherit what's happening now. It's us who will feel the most drier, you know, the drastic um, consequences of what's going on. And so I think that on CNN, on MSNBC, instead of having all these pundits who, are, who were wrong in 2016 talking about what they think is possible and realistic— Get young people on there. Get young people to say, this is what I imagine. Because I think that is the most threatening thing to empire is imagination to say that there is an alternative, that this is not the way that it has to be, and that there is another way, a better way, a more perfect way. Would you encourage then, would you encourage young people to go beyond showing up for marches and building platforms uh, from which to speak? Would you encourage them to go beyond that to actually get involved in politics? Um, you're 24. I've pointed that out several times. I think it, it, it I think it, it, it means something to keep pointing out 
that when most people are just getting out of college and they don't know what they're doing, you've already been in this game for years, right? We talked about 17 years old, uh, 16 years old, 15 years old, collecting signatures and really, uh, yeah, being a, being a change maker, even as a young kid in Oakland and now in Tennessee, what's, what's your advice to be, we're going to get to talking about what you're actually running for and why you're running for that, that, uh, position, that office. And I, we have so much more to talk about, but, um, would you encourage, we've got, cause we've got this incredible day, right? We've got, um, a friend of mine, Ted Terry, mayor of Clarkston, Georgia, uh, who was featured on queer eye and, uh, he's, he's, he's now running. Um, what is he running for? He's running for a, um, do you know who I'm talking about? Ted Terry? I know that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So he was, he is, was the mayor of Clarkston. He was running for a Congress. Uh, he was running for Congress, and now I think he's running for a, maybe it's Senate or, and I should have probably checked this up before doing this, but I love yeah. Ted. Yeah. You have uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You've got Ilhan Omar. You've got all these uh, amazing young people. And again, agree with their platform or not, it's so admirable that at such a young age, they are taking this pol the political bull by the horns and saying, like, I'm in. Like, I'm going to give my life uh, these people are too old that are dictating what we do and, uh, you know, yeah, how we should live. I'm going to do something about it. So you've got Ted Terry's, you've got Alexandria Cortez, Cortez, you've got Justin Jones's that are doing something about it. So would you, every couple of years, there are seats and there are positions that open up that can be challenged, right? You are challenging Jim Cooper, right? Someone who has been in the game for, 30 years. Decades, over, yeah. right? Decades. Uh, would, you, would you recommend, would you advise young people to get involved? And if so, how should they go about doing so? Yeah, I definitely would involve young people to get involved. Um, running for office is just one way, though. I think that we still need community organizers. We still need people assuming other leadership roles in the movement. Um, but I, I decided, you know, to, to make this transition from movement to electoral politics, something that I never imagined. Um, just realizing that for you know seven years now we've we've spoken truth to power. We've begged politicians to change. We've tried to get them to you know switch on environmental justice, to switch on racial justice issues, to switch on economic justice, and and they keep telling us that you know it's not the right time. That you know that we need to 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 just play the game a little bit longer. And even when I announced that I'm running, people said I didn't go through the proper line. That I cut the line. And to me, that's the most ridiculous thing. That Stupid. we have this this line of people yep. who are who feel entitled to a position when this is not, I'm not running for Jim Cooper seat. I'm running for the Tennessee's fifth congressional district seat. It's the people seat. Yep. And each person who's sent, who's in there is just a temporary employee. And so I think that young people can run for office that we don't just have to be interns for these people. We don't have to just, you know, try and, and you go through their game and play their game and, you know, you know, just kind of stand in line and wait our turn that it's our time now. And that is interesting that um, this district that I'm running for the fifth congressional district, um, my opponent, he was 26 years old when he ran for this seat. His predecessor, Al Gore, who many of us know, was 26 years old when he ran for the seat. And so when it's white men whose family have been in politics yep. for, for yep. you know, as a family game, it's okay. But as a young man of color, when I get involved, they say, oh, you're too young. It's not your time. But why was it okay for them and not for us? And so I think young people, you'll get tricked by with this imposter syndrome. People will make you feel like you're not ready. You are ready because you know these issues more than some of these people who, who don't know what it's like to catch the bus to work. They don't know what it's like to have student loan debt because they inherited millions. They don't know what it's like to have to get, you know, just decide between groceries and prescriptions. They don't know what it's like, you know, to to have the fear of, of, of you know, your family are immigrants. And so what is this sort of hate against immigrants that this administration is perpetuating mean for your family? And so, like, these are things that we're experts on that they'll never know because you cannot read about those things. It comes through experience. And so I think young people have a wisdom that's needed in Congress right now. And that wisdom is is a long sighted vision to say that, you know, we, we want to not just survive. We want a, a community that will thrive, you know, generations from now. And so I think that is something that's really empowering to see. And, and a lot of young people are running in this election. You have people like Jessica Cisneros in Texas challenging um, yep, yep. a representative who's been there a long time and who's one of the most conservative members. You have um, in, in Ohio, Morgan Harper. You have a lot of young people running and saying that we are not playing the game anymore. We're tired of the game because it's hurting us and it's not helping us. You brought up something interesting a few, a few minutes ago. Um, about how, yeah, encouraging young people, especially young people of color, disenfranchised young people, you are ready. So, so if, if someone is listening right now and they are, you know, 23, 24, they're as white as white can get, came from privilege, but they see the downfall of that. They don't want, they, they, they don't want to be part of the legacy that they're currently inheriting. They want to do things differently. Should they, but, and they have the desire to run for some office, should they not? 
and should they try to support, should they look for, uh, generally, you know, uh, disenfranchised people that do want to run and support them or should, or, or, you know what I'm saying? Like, should they, cause, cause should, yeah, should they give that to someone else or should they run and say, I want to do things differently than my fathers and forefathers did it? Does my, does my question make yeah. sense? I mean, I wouldn't discourage anyone from running. I think running is a, is a, it needs to be a personal decision, a moral decision, a spiritual decision. And so just look like, you know, when I, I'll just go through my process of how I decided to run because yeah, that's when, great. When I ran, I announced in November, you know, of last year, we had been waiting for someone to announce in our district. There hasn't been a primary here in ten years, and so we had waited and waited and waited. No one announced. You know, no one, no one was going. So we we were talking as as organizers, saying, you know, who's going to step forward? And then I was approached by some union members who, you know, who. Real quick, wh- what's your theory on why no one was running? Are they just happy with? The, no, the, not, well, what's going on or just laziness it, or just complacency or what? I mean, I, I still see, see it now. People are afraid. People, we have a city in which the congressman and the mayor are brothers. You have a family dynasty yeah. controlling the city. Their dad was the governor. People are afraid of, of going up against the grain. And even with me, people said, you're going to be, you're going to be ostracized from some places. You'll lose friends. That has happened. But it, that, that is just a clearing out of, of, of what needed to happen. And so I think people were afraid to be that first ripple because now that I've announced, there's many more people who have announced as well for this race. And so we had the first primary in 10 years. And I'm excited for that. I think that's what democracy looks like. A primary yeah. is democracy. Yep. And so anyone can put their, their name in. But I think that whoever runs, you need to be accountable to a movement, accountable to a community. And I think, um, you know, for me, it was it was not a decision. It was people reaching out saying, would you run? You know, um, one of my dear friends, Benny Overton, he was a president of, of United, Auto, United Auto Workers Union locally. He was one of the first people to really push me to run. And I was like, it's not my time. I'm, I'm not ready for this. I, I don't have the patience for it. And and he really, you know, was uplifting and saying that it is your time that, you know, we have a crisis going on when it comes to democracy, when it comes to the environment that we have to take on with bold, radical change. And so that's someone who's inspired me. People like Miss Corinne, who's 86 years old, lived here her whole life in Nashville, was another mentor. So I think that you need to do this in community. When we announced at Fisk University, if you look at the video of our announcement, it was intergenerational, it was multiracial. You had people who were in unions, you had students, you had medical professionals, you had, you know, people who are undocumented. That's what our movement looks like, and that's how we hope to bring that power into Congress, into Washington from Nashville. Let's talk for a minute about local versus national politics. Uh, there's not one person, if we went outside right now and polled, if we went out to this lobby of this of the hotel where we're, where we're recording right now, but if we walked outside and just walked around all day, there's probably, we might encounter one or two people, period, but most people, 99%, will be able to tell us who the president is. Um, of the United States. Uh, and if you name like some very like key leaders in the country, they could, they can name them vice president, you know, and otherwise, but they probably wouldn't recognize you, right? Most people, they would just be like, who's, who's this guy? Or if we started saying, who are your city, who's your city councilwoman, your city councilman, who are this like treasure, like all these, if we started naming all of these local politicians that what they do and what they say what they act on, what they don't act on directly affects you and me. Sidewalks being built, teachers getting paid more, all, all sorts of things in our city. And yet no one, very few people, not no one, very few people get involved in local politics, even to know the names of people that are running or have run, people that are occupying certain positions. They don't even go that far, let alone know their position on X, Y, or Z to know what platform they ran on, to know what they're doing. Are they doing a great job? Are they doing a shitty job? Like they don't know those things, let alone just the names of these people. That's a tragedy to me that we know that we let people, uh, now I, I, it's not a secret on this podcast that I do not like, uh, and I'll, I'm putting it very mildly, do not like Donald Trump or his, or how he, yeah, how he is running this country or him as a person. I have no no, no like for him whatsoever. But um, there are so many people that know what's going on at that level much more than they know what's going on locally when there's a million things each and every day that we do that that man and his administration can't touch, right? But people, the people that I just said, city councilmen, councilwomen, uh, all, all the different positions that people ha- hold locally, that does that does affect the city that I live in, this, the community that I live in, my neighborhood. 
So let's talk for a second about local politics. What is your recommendation? Because people are going to be listening to this podcast that live in 50 different states and uh, a couple dozen different countries, right? So people that aren't even in American politics are going to be listening to our conversation. What is your position on local politics and how heavily people should get involved there versus putting all their effort into knowing everything that's happening at a, at a national level? Some of that does affect us, right? Some of that does affect us. But so much of it doesn't, and we're not working. We're not moving in our community. So speak to that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think people should be involved in local politics, which is why we spent seven years challenging the legislature, challenging the state capitol that's right in our backyard here in Nashville. But I, I would I would take a step back real quick and just, I think that the indictment on lack of knowing who these people are should not fall on the people, but it falls on those members who have been disconnected. For example, every weekend okay. now, we've been canvassing in different parts of the neighborhood in North Nashville and Antioch and um, East Nashville, canvassing, talking to people about this primary that's going on. A lot of people don't know who our congressman's congressman is. He's yep. been there for 30 years. Yep. That is not their fault. That is his fault that he did not go to these neighborhoods and make known that he is he is their employee. He's here to help them. And so I think that it's interesting that, you know, I, I, we always put the onus on the people, but people are working, you know, two jobs for part time wages. People don't. That's how the system's set up to make it so you cannot participate and keep it's up a great with point. C-SPAN every day. It's a great point. And so I think that's kind of what. We're trying to change. We're trying to make politics a little bit more accessible and relevant to people, particularly young people, and to make it digestible because they, they make it feel like you have to be an expert to believe, you know, to understand healthcare policy, for example. They're like, you know, you have all these plans going on and, and it, you feel like you have to have a financial degree, a business degree, you know, health policy degree to understand what's happening. And that should not be the case. Like we should be able to discuss politics, you know, at a coffee shop with our friends. And, and we should, you know, we can we can know who people are, but more importantly, we should we should know they should make their, an effort to make it themselves known to us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I think with city council, I think things are changing. That's the one good thing about this Trump administration is that a lot of people are, the veil is being pulled off. And a lot more people I talk to know Supreme Court members because yeah. people are paying attention. Yeah. Yep. They know, you know, who who their Congress members are now because there are movements to primary people. People are learning. And I think, I mean, that's why Nashville has the most diversity council in our history. You know, we had the first Latina elected, the first Muslim member, and also Nigerian elected. I think we have, you know, Parity between men and women on city council because people are getting involved. So I think it's shifting. And if any good can come from the evil of the Trump administration, it's that the veil has been removed and that people are awakening and rising up saying that we cannot be complacent anymore. That's so true. Uh, I've had that discussion on this on this podcast several times, most recently with Jeremy Cowart, a friend of mine. And we that was precisely what we talked about for an hour was various angles at at least we're doing something now. At least we know. Because during... Uh, yeah, previous administrations, nobody, nobody gave a shit, like even at a national level. So let alone the local level at a national level, like you're saying, nobody cared about who I shouldn't say nobody, very few people cared about who, you know, the new Supreme court justice nominees are, or who was getting this position or that position in the white house. I can't at this moment name the press secretary for Obama administration. You know, he had a couple, I think, but I, I can't name them. But I can name you every press secretary under the Trump administration because they were so, uh, not, not, yeah, yeah, not great at their job, right? And so, yes, that is a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because that is so true that now everybody, even if they're not yet getting involved at a local level, and I guess that's a great point about it's the it's it's the fault of the representative, the local representative, for not. If anybody goes on your social media right now, the last several pictures over the last several days or the last several posts that you've posted will be of you canvassing, talking to people, right? And that is an important job for you. Most of your constituents are, like you said, working one job or two jobs. They're paying off student loans. They've got one kid or three kids. They've got all, they've got all this weight on their shoulders. Now, having said that, what are some very easy ways, because I don't want to take, I think you're hundred percent right. Thank you for pointing that out. But I also don't want to take the onus off of, I don't want to take the, I think there is some weight for local constituents to, there are easy ways they can get involved without it being so burdensome. So what are some of those ways? There, there are meet, you, you said right after this, right after our podcast, you're going to a transportation meeting, right? Yeah, right at the library. Um, now, is that something that I could go to, that any of us can go yeah, to, can go right? To so what are some ways like that that people can get involved? These are easy ways. 
Transportation is a huge issue in Nashville. Um, but look at when they're having the meeting. They're having it when working class people are at work. That's the other thing. We have to make these meetings more accessible. Is this a meeting with the mayor? Yeah. Okay. At the library. And so I think I think going to meetings. So yeah, it's at noon, right? You at said noon, it's at, at 1130 11 in the yeah. morning. Yeah. And, and lo- most working class people who use transportation are at work. <laughs> so, that, you know, we have to make things accessible, have child care, things like that. But what I would say people can do to get involved is to find, you know, those issues that you're passionate about and, and to start tracking them at the legislature. You know, there's groups for Moms of Man Action. If you're passionate about gun action, there, there's Moms Clean Air Force if you care about you know, environmental justice, there's, you know, the student groups that are happening. I think that was the best way for me to get involved because it also, it not only helps you get involved, but also gives you hope to know that you're not in this alone. Like when you find groups that of people who care about what you care about, it helps to combat nihilism and hopelessness and feeling yeah, isolated. Sure. So I think that's, it, it'll, it'll be good for your own mental and spiritual health as well. Um, I think, I think, you know, trying to to read more local news as opposed to just the national news. I, I've, I've stopped watching national news because it is just what Trump tweeted every day. And yep. I think that is his way of getting in our head. And that, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a very, easy very intentional. Tactic. And the media falls into it every time. It's like his tweet should not be the top story when we have 140 million poor people in this nation who, who are, whose needs are not being met. And so we have to shift the moral narrative. And so I think reading more local news, um, reading more, I think that's a good thing about Twitter too, is like we are able to have more a more multitude of voices talking about what matters in our community right now because we would have no idea you know if we just looked at national news that right now in tennessee you know on tomorrow on thursday there's going to be uh, a meeting about removing the nathan bedford forest bus that a lot of people find very offensive and insulting we would not know that core civic is you know reporting you know the private prison company here in tennessee is is um, reporting high higher profits thanks to the Trump administration and how immoral that is. So I mean, we would not know about what Bloomberg is doing if it wasn't for social media and people calling out his his complicity with systemic racism. Um, and so I think I think you know finding those cultivating social media to be informative and not just a place where you go and get depressed. I think too is important. And so yeah, it's very easy to get depressed. Very easy <laughs> going on there. I did myself a solid a few months ago by unfollowing every news every there's some local nashville ones but i'm saying at a national level everyone cnn msnbc uh, washington post atlantic all of them i still follow a few journalists that represent those agencies that i know that i'll get what i need to get through them but i followed all of their main accounts because it was so much you know what we should be talking about every day is that this that every year in the United States, 675,000 people will go bankrupt because because of medical bills. Yeah, and we should contra- compare and contrast that with the 125 million million dollar tax refund that Amazon got off of 11 billion dollars of profit. Exactly. That should be front page news, not, not the latest himself king or any of the stuff. Not the latest <laughs> shitty thing, because you're so right. It is so tactical. I have erred on the side of calling him dumb. Sometimes he is the opposite of dumb. He is so strategic. Now, I don't think he's like intelligent. You know, I think that's clear. But but he is very smart and strategic about what he's doing because it is getting in all of our heads. He is all that anyone is talking about 24-7. While there are so many things that are happening in our, whether it's Nashville or Cincinnati, Ohio or uh, Paducah, Kentucky or Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Right now, there are things happening in your local city and even in your community that you need to know about. Yeah. And not care as much about the latest thing that he, uh, he Trump, he, he must not be named, uh, tweeted, you know? Yeah. And so that's, yeah, very important stuff. Let's talk about some of your issues uh, because, because some of the issues that you, the, some of the platform that you're running on are things that do affect those in Tennessee, in your jurisdiction, what could be your kind of area, but they're also national. These are also, na- every one of these is happening at a national level. So let's talk about some of them because I want to know why these are the, I picked five off your website. I want to know why these are the five things. These are five things that I also think need to change like ASAP. I know for every one of these five issues, I have people in my very close, direct, close knit community that have been affected by every single one of these. And so they're very personal as well as they're very personal because you're running to be a leader in my area. Like you will lead me. I think that's amazing that someday, hopefully me as a 36 year old, uh, citizen who lives here, you know, pays taxes here, but also does stuff all over the world. Like yeah. I, I am going to be following your lead 24 year old. I think that's amazing. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> you will get it. I will work hard to make sure that happens. Appreciate it. <laughs> but let's, uh, so healthcare for all, 
why is that? I just read a tweet today, and I want to point this out. I think it because I, I think it. You know, uh, she's trying to. You know, this this tweeter, this tweeter, this Twitter account was trying to be. You know, very. Uh, they're trying to push buttons with this, but I think it's so so true. She said uh, it's Kashana Cauley on Twitter. She said, "Kind of wild how the most far left extremist militant position you can take on healthcare is that." People should have it, <laughs> right? True. Yeah, I have these conversations all the time. My one main issue for choosing a primary candidate and then a general election candidate for president of the United States—that's my number one issue. Yeah. I want to hear on so many other things. Um, I supported Andrew Yang big time until he dropped out last. I mean, I still support him, but like he's not running anymore. But for me, the main issue is medicare for all it's everyone should have health care we can talk about other things later but if you don't have your health yeah. you don't have anything i may uh i can work i have skills i have talents and i'm still paying off a hospital bill from two years ago i spent 45 minutes i had this I woke up in the middle of the night with this crazy intense like i've never felt before shooting pain in my leg and I thought there was like a blood clot. Well, I talk, I call one of my neighbor friends or my nurse friends and she said, you, there might be a blood clot, like go to the hospital. So I, and I have insurance. So I, I have insurance and this is still the bill that's coming out of this 45 minutes there. They said, nothing's wrong. And this is kind of embarrassing to even talk about or to kind of, cause they did, they did diagnose my problem and that was uh, tight jeans. Wow. Not joking. <laughs> so I left there feeling not embarrassed, like really, because I don't give a shit. But but it was like, your problem isn't a blood clot. It's that you wear skinny jeans <laughs> and you I sit for nine hours a day in front of a computer. So it was like cutting off circulation. blood circulation right at my waist. So anyway, but 45 minutes in the hospital, they didn't do anything. A doctor saw me for five minutes and I got a $3,500 bill from that. They didn't do anything for me. They told me your jeans are too tight. Buy looser jeans. And I still am paying that off. Um, so healthcare for all, why, why is this an issue that you're, why is this on um, one of your main things on your platform? Yeah. And you talking about healthcare being your number one issue. You're in line with the majority of Americans right now in this election. Um, for me, healthcare started with my mom. My mom put herself through nursing school when I was growing up. My grandmother was a nurse for 40 years when she came here from the Philippines. And so grew up learning about the importance of healthcare, came to Tennessee. It was the first issue that I was ever arrested for was for Medicaid expansion. Um, and, and I got involved with healthcare issue because we were at the legislature and hearing testimony of people like Michelle Fardan, whose daughter did have a blood clot in her leg, did not have health coverage, lives here in Nashville, and ended up dying from a blood clot in her leg. That's something that was preventable because the, the extremists in our legislature said, we don't want that Obamacare, so we're not going to expand Medicaid. I met people in East Tennessee when I was walking through five rural counties um, on a walk in Senator Mike Bell's district, like Larry Drain, who had to separate from his wife just so she can keep her health insurance when she was having seizures. It is immoral and it's insane. And in um, the summer of 2015, I, I went to North Carolina, to Bellhaven, North Carolina, and walked 278 miles from Bellhaven to Washington, D.C. with a Republican mayor, with um, black leaders from the NAACP, healthcare um, hospital workers, and, and other students walking 278 miles to raise awareness about the crisis of rural hospital closures. Because that same crisis is, is impacting hospitals in this city, like Metro Nashville, that, that, is, you know, that is impacted by lack of Medicaid expansion. So healthcare is a very personal issue. It's something that I, I, I've, I've seen personally in my family, as many of my relatives have faced cancer recently. Um, and so I think that it's something that we that is not a political issue. It's an issue of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and I, as we look at what's happening, I think that it has to have a national solution because you have states like Tennessee that are refusing to expand Medicaid to 300,000 people because they want to stick on this, you know, this obstructionism of the Affordable Care Act um, to spite a black man who's in the White House. And it's hurting their own people in their own districts. And so Medicare for all is, is something that's common sense. We know that a lot of young people we met with some yesterday are afraid of turning 26 because they'll lose health coverage on their parents, and so they don't know what they'll do. Um, and this is a real anxiety. You have people who are right now are, are you know, if they, if they have to go to the hospital, they, they don't want to go, they want to take a lift instead of the ambulance because they'll be pocketed with that bill. And so I think it's interesting that in Nashville, we call ourselves the healthcare capital of the world. Yeah. We have all these hospitals, but we have so many people who, who, who would rather just be sick than go to those hospitals because of these, these outrageous bills that you're talking about. And so I think it's interesting. Uh, Medicare for all is something that I support. It's something that... I think we know the majority of people support um, and that it will help people to have more freedom of choice where they can pick, you know, where they go to the hospital, they get to keep their doctor, um, it will lower ph pharmaceutical costs because, again, so many people choose, we, we literally meet people who choose between saying, am I going to get my prescription or am I going to get groceries or pay Insane. my electricity bill? That's evil. It's like evil. It's, it's evil. And then people, this is the thing that we always hear is that, how are we going to pay for this? You can't afford that. 
And I think, you know, if we look at the other policy issue that we're fighting against, it's this endless wars that in last in December, Congress passed a bill to give two hundred seventy eight billion dollars to the military industrial complex. Hardly any Republicans or Democrats challenged that. It was just passed, yeah. increasing it yeah. with no question. Yeah, that was a sad it. day, even as a Democrat. And for a space force, yep. something that won't impact this district. No, nope. but that's something that you know my, my opponent's number one issue, and yet it doesn't help our people here. And so I think that we can we can have health care. We we can join other nations, and that I'm as someone who comes from an ancestry in the Philippines where my grandparents did not have health care, and then my grandma that co- came to this country to be a nurse to get involved in the healthcare system. Like you see the importance of this. You see the importance of having a healthy being for every aspect. You cannot exercise any other right if you don't have health care. If you're not alive to exercise your voting rights, your you know your economic rights if you're not healthy. And so that's why I think Dr. King said of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Yeah. And you're saying, no, I totally agree with all of that. I'm, I'm over here like fist pumping my way through that little, that, <laughs> that, uh, that monologue just now, but you're saying it, it, and it has to be done at a national level because I, that was the, that's one of the biggest pushbacks that I get from a lot of my Republican and more libertarian leading friends is well, yeah, maybe everybody should have health care, but it needs to be done at a state and a, and a, at a state level. But what you're saying is they're not going to do it, right? And and that's that's so true that if we leave it to the different states, we have plenty of proof. We have loads of data that say they're going to choose other issues like a fucking space force or like more 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 robust military presence when we don't have any enemies right now. Yes, there are there are things that we have. There are there are issues. There are maybe some tension that we have to quell, and I, I get all of that. But we have no imminent like threats, and yet we have hundreds and hundreds of military bases all around the world, way more than anyone has. Like we outnumber them by hundred, you know, hundreds of percents. Uh, the amount of military, the, the level of military presence that we have. And that's an issue that's not just here in Tennessee, but in many other states. They're going to give more attention and more money and more support to that, this kind of unknown enemy, or more support to let's build a wall, uh, a vanity wall, uh, which we've seen the other day in videos. They, they're already scaling it. They've, they, they've made a very cheap ladder that can scale it in a few seconds, so it's a pointless wall. It literally is a vanity wall. <laughs> we're, we're, we're putting all of our money into that. When there will be people that can't get out and vote in the next few months because of their health, yeah. they w- they want to vote. They want to get out and vote and support and rally behind and be a part of this amazing system that we have or once had, but they can't because they literally don't have the they, the one thing that they should have that prevents them from doing is is health. They can't go to the doctor because of the bill. Yeah. They can't they can't get their because med- they just don't have the money, and that is. Evil. I think it's evil. It's evil is immoral, and we have to call it that. And, and we have to look at healthcare. We, we do, you know, you cannot say healthcare is a human right and then say, well, you know, we're going to have all these barriers put in place for you to access it. And so I think that if we leave the state, you'll have states like Tennessee who's trying to pass a block right now. That means less people will be covered. We, we cannot trust states like like the legislator here in Tennessee to come up with a healthcare program to cover all people because no. they don't they don't believe in healthcare as a right. It's interesting that these lawmakers in our legislature, once they serve a certain number of years, they get healthcare for life that we pay for, and so that, so it's okay for them, but it's not good for the rest of us. Why is that? Issue number two, because uh, we could talk about that for forever. We need to move on. Issue number two: building a welcoming America. You are the product of immigration. I'm a second generation immigrant. My dad came here from Guatemala uh, when I was younger yeah. or when he was, sorry, when he was younger. And so why is that a substantial issue on your platform? Yeah. And I'll even be more specific. I think one way we do that is that by abolishing ICE. I think that in Nashville, the past year, we've seen ICE, you know, show up at grocery stores and shoot people here in Nashville. You've had them show up in front of people's houses, holding a father and son in their car in the summertime, hostage in the heat where their air conditioning was running out. You had people showing up at some of the schools here in Nashville. And so we know that that is not welcoming, that one in 10 people in Nashville are immigrants. And that if, even, even if we go to the rural counties in our district in Cheatham and Dixon, many of the people who are working on these uh, in agriculture are immigrants. And so we want to build a welcoming America because unless you're Cherokee, Choctaw, Shawnee in Tennessee, you are an immigrant. Even those who say that I'm a seventh generation Tennessee and your people came from somewhere. Yeah. And so, you know, Governor Lee, Jim Cooper, 
your last names are not those Cherokee names or Choctaw names. And so that means you come from somewhere. And so I think it's just this recognition that that is the legacy of America and that we, we want to build a welcoming America because we look at who is, Nashville is the it city right now. And you see all this construction happening. Go to those sites and see who's 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 building it. Yeah. See who's yeah. Really the, the heartbeat of the city right now. It is it's the, our migrant brothers and sisters. And so we cannot allow, we, we have to treat them with dignity and, and human rights and that abolishing ICE is possible. ICE was created in 2002 after September 11th, and it can be restructured into the Department of Justice, the Department of Commerce, where it has more accountability than it has now, where it's, where it's running rogue and terrorizing people. And I think that's immoral as well, and that, that is something that we have to think about. Why are our immigrant brothers and sisters afraid of participating in the census, of, of you know, of, of going out shopping when, when you have an administration that has created so much hate about them and, and put them at risk of, of not feeling welcome and feeling like they're a target? I also support abolishing ICE, but so is there, what's the alternative Right. If we abolish ICE tomorrow, we can still because this is something that I think people don't think can actually happen. Those that support ICE, this administration definitely thinks this or at least says they think this, that if we do away with ICE, if we do away with this oppressive fear mongering, uh, you know, border border patrol and all throughout the U.S., like that, that people are going to, you know, one of the things that uh, this administration and, uh, you know, others that support this administration will say is like, you know, one of the biggest things they always talk about is Obama and Hillary and all these wanted free open borders, which none of them wanted that. None of them. Nobody ever said, take all the fences down, just like no no border between Canada or Mexico and the U.S. and just everybody can come and go as they want. Nobody actually wants that. We obviously see the need for – there needs to be a system and a process in place. So, um, yeah, what is the alternative? If we get rid of ICE, we can still we protect – We didn't have ICE until 2002. We functioned without ICE until 2002. Those those – those processes were through the Department of Justice and the Department of Commerce. There was much more accountability in those agencies than now you created this rogue agency of ICE that is not, you know, these are not even officers. You know, these people who come and these ICE agents are not are not officers. And so they, they, they need to have warrants from judges and yet they act without that. And so I think we need a system that is accountable to human rights standards, international human rights law, and accountable to civil rights of our own nation. Um, and due process. And so I think that it's possible that people cannot imagine a world without ICE. We had it into, until 2002. We created this fear of immigrants and refugees. And, and, and going with it, refugees as well, refugees are the most highly vetted people to come into this nation. And yet we're putting up all these new barriers and we don't want any refugees because of, you know, we're portraying people who are black and brown as terrorists. When in fact, these are the most highly vetted people to come into this nation. Yeah. And if you look at terrorism, it is white supremacists that are the real terrorists in this nation. And yet we don't, you know, there's no sort of monitoring or no, no sort of fear created around that. And I think it, that we have to talk about the immigration crisis as a crisis of systemic racism as well. And that people are creating a fear of immigrants. They want to have these agencies to make people feel unwelcome because they're afraid that America is changing. Because we know the demographics are shifting here. And, 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 and people, that makes some people afraid. But it shouldn't. Because, again, the history of America is a history of migration. Yeah. Yeah. We, we literally were built on that. Definitely. Number three, affordable, equitable higher education. Why is that important for you? As a college student, um, one of the issues that we keep hearing from young people is that it's a burden to put an entire generation under the the constraints and the chains of student loan debt. Um, you, you have people who have $30,000 of student loan debt just trying to get an education because we've been told our whole lives you have to get a higher education to be able to you know compete in this world. And you get that, and then you're stuck for your whole life paying off debt. Um, and so if we can bail out Wall Street, we can bail out students seeking education. I think that we also need to fund HBCUs. Nashville has four HBCUs, FIST, TSU, Meharry, and American Baptist College that have been, you know, rich legacies in the city, and yet they don't have equitable funding. And so that's another part of our, our, our platform. But we think that higher education, that people who want it should not have to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands just trying to get education, that it should be a right for those who want it, and that um, that is possible, and that it's something that you, you hear on a national stage right now where people are talking about, you know, canceling student loan debt. We believe that is true. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I just took a leave of absence from Vanderbilt Divinity School getting my master's, but I'm leaving college with tens of thousands of debt trying to get an education so I could, you know, work in the community and do the job that I want to do and, and help my people. And, 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 you know, my debt is not even compared to some people who have $300,000, right. $400,000 in right. debt. How will you pay that off? <laughs> yeah, I have several friends that have been paying for 10, 12 years. And the, the amount that they owe right now, if they open their account, is higher than when they started. Wow. 10 years of paying it off and the amount is higher. Like, that's insane. It is. I mean, you, it's, it's, a, it's a burden. And again, everybody chose to do this, but it shouldn't be that way in the first place, especially when you see some of these colleges and their endowments, you know, they're getting so much money from outside support 
and yet they're saddling their students with a tremendous debt that won't leave them until they're 40 or 50. Like, And they chose it, but it's like we it's kind of like this choice that you have to do in right. today's society to be competitive. And I think in a way, debt is a way to keep people complacent. Because oh, yeah. When people are held in debt, it's it's a, it's a form of bondage where you, you can't be as radical as you want because, you, oh, you got to pay off. You know, you can't you cannot follow your vision because you got to pay off this, you know. You, and so it's a way to constrain people. I think it's intentional. And I think it's it is something that we got to think about systemically. Like we can cancel entire generations debt. Um, if we can do it for Wall Street, you know, after the with that bailout, we can do it for Main Street and, with, and the students and the working class people who are suffering. Um, and it is suffering. Debt is a form of suffering where yeah. you feel like you're not worthy, you're not doing enough, and you're told that, you know, it's your fault, but it's not your fault. And I think, again, we have to talk about it systemically. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, yes, obviously you chose to sign documents and, you know, start as a student, both as undergraduate and now graduate. But you, But the system... I mean, there are jobs right now that will pay somebody 15, 20 bucks an hour that require a college degree. Like yeah. that's insane, yeah. right? You can't pay, you can't even live life on 15 to 20 dollars an hour, let alone pay off these tremendous debts that you have. Like it's, it's very true that I think the motivation, maybe, no, maybe people aren't thinking about it very, there are a lot of people in the system that aren't thinking about that actively on a day-to-day -day basis, but the system is built to keep people quiet mm -hmm. because when you're not saddled by debt, the pressure is gone. You can there can be revolutions. Yeah. There can be radical living. There can be, hey, I'm going to walk 300 miles from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. to protest X, Y, or Z. Like That can happen now when you're not thinking, well, I have to go to work 10 hours a day every single day just literally just to get by. Exactly. Uh, number four. You have a you you have a transportation meeting to get to, so I want to respect your time. An economy for people. What does that mean for you, and why is that important? An economy for people um, means that we – we value workers and, and the working class over corporations. And so we look right now we have an economy for corporations. If you look at Nashville, we just gave a, a huge million, multi-million dollar incentive for Amazon to come to our city to open a regional headquarters. And yet we say we don't have money to you know, raise wages in this in the state, in the city. Um, and yet we can give money to corporations like Amazon and HCA to come here. And so an economy for workers is a, an economy that values people who are the laborers, who are really the people and not just, you know, keeping wealth concentrated in, in, in the hands of CEOs and billionaires, but really having it, you know, redistributed to people. Some people might call it socialism. Dr. Martin Luther King called it, um, you can, he said you can call it dem democracy or democratic socialism, but we need a radical redistribution of wealth and power in the society. And I agree with that. I think that in Nashville and Tennessee right now, you, we have huge wealth inequality. We have, you know, a system that's becoming a play, our city's becoming a playground for the rich. You see so many people being pushed by gentrification, being pushed to the margins. Um, and, and I think it's something that we can, we can shake up and we can, we can have a larger conversation about. Um, and they'll try and put labels of socialism. They'll try to put labels on, you know, you're, you're trying to get handouts. And that's not the truth. What people are looking for is a hand up. They're looking for the same thing that many of these people who now find themselves wealthy got um, through these systems that gave them an advantage that many of us did not have. And so um, I believe in raising the minimum wage. 725 is not a wage you can survive mm -hmm. off of. We stand in solidarity with the Fight for 15 movement. And those fast food workers are saying we need to raise our wages to at least 15 um, and then, you know, increase it with in inflation. Um, we believe that... Um, that also, you know, there needs to be workers' rights, that we've had so many instances in Nashville with construction going on of unsafe work conditions, of people actually dying because we did not treat them with dignity and we did not value their lives and well-being. And so we, we believe in workers' protections and we believe in in trade agreements that in, that protect vi um, environmental but as well as um, worker rights. And so um, those are some things that that means for us. Yeah, and there's. I want to point out that we could do an hour on each one of these points because there's so, so much to talk about, including this last one, which is, uh, ending mass incarceration. Yeah. Why is that a fundamental part of your platform? Something that you want to talk about all the time, so much so that you put it on your website is like, this is an issue for me. Yeah. I mean, that's a big one. That's something that's very unique huge. to our district because 37208, we know, is the most incarcerated district. I mean, incarcerated zip code in the nation. And it's by no accident that we also are the community where Core Civic, formerly CCA, was founded a for profit private prison company. And so we know that. There is an incentive to incarcerate black and brown communities that needs to be addressed here. And that one of the ways that we can address that is by saying that we should not have for-profit private prison companies. We should abolish them and cancel our contracts with them. Both in Nashville, there's a conversation at the city level, but on a federal level, we need to have this discussion as well. 
Um, and we need to look at, you know, not just like when people get out, but like now we know when they're moving toward these electronic monitoring systems where you'll still be incarcerated, but you'll still, you know, you'll just be at your home with this monitor on. And so I think it's so interesting, too, that um, how this relates to going to democracy, where one in 12 people in Tennessee cannot vote, one in 12 black men cannot vote because of felony disenfranchisement. So when they incarcerate you, they take away your vote. They make it harder for you to get a job. They make it harder for you to get health care um, because they, you know, they try and put this label of felon on you. And and so I think it's it's, it's just so outrageous that we have so many people here who were in the buckle of the Bible belt who talk about redemption all the time. And they, they, they talk about redemption when it comes to certain people, but when it comes to people who, who have paid their debt, who, you know, have done their time and who even in fact should not have been in jail in the first place, if we're honest. So many of them. So many for of sure. them. Um, there's no redemption for them. There's no, there's no, you know, there's no opportunity for them. And so I think we have to analyze that why it is in Tennessee that African Americans are only 20% of the population, and yet we make up disproportionate amounts of the prison population here, um, 40% in some places. And so I think I think we have to have a larger conversation about that and talk about it as a way of of ending mass incarceration, but also building, um, you know, looking at restorative justice. And so what does that mean? You know, when we talk about criminal justice, we also talk about the death penalty. We need to abolish the death penalty in our state. We yes. have had this increase in, in executions. An execution on Got Thursday. Got one coming Thursday, yeah. Exactly. And, Which and, is just, I mean, we went years without any. Without, yeah. And now in the last 18 months, there's been six or seven. And there's no like, reason. It's insane. No, there's no reason at all. And, and Bill Lee should know better. Yeah. He is a Christian man. Yeah. He says he follows Jesus, who called us to make peace. Um, and who was who very, in his whole in his whole life, and his everything he taught was very anti. He would, there's no doubt in my mind that if, we could pick a variety of issues, but he would be very anti-death penalty, Definitely. like in every way. And here we are as a Christian city, yeah. and I say that very loosely, but there's so many Christians, air quotes, Christians here, being led you know, in a state by a Christian governor that we're going to execute yet someone else in a very horrific way. The whole liturgy, my friend Shane Claiborne called it like the liturgy of death, yeah. like all, yeah, like the even everything, the preparation, the last meal, all of that, like it is sickening, yeah. and yet we're going to do it again in two days. Yeah. I mean, I, when I was interning in D.C. in 2016, I went to their fast that they were having outside the Supreme Court about the death penalty. And that's really where I, where I met Shane and where I, nice. where I heard the story about um, one of the things that really shifted me was a mother um, whose child had been killed. And yet she was against the death penalty for the, the man who killed her daughter because she said, as a Christian, she said, as, as, as a Christian— the state killed my savior. I cannot allow the state to kill anybody else, you know, mm. because, and that's something that just stuck with me, that grace and that sort of, that sort of knowledge. And I think it's something that we like here where we do have a lot of Christians. We, you know, people who claim to be Christian, we have churches on every corner here. And yet you, you don't have, you don't have that way of life. You have systems of death that are being perpetuated, that are being uplifted, that are being valued because there's not, nothing comes out of killing people to show that killing is wrong. Nothing comes out of that. And yet it's just, it's just this sort of obligation that they feel like, you know, we've been to the vigils, everyone that's happened except one, and it's just this big triumphant display of state power. You have people on horseback that's down it. at the priv at River it. Bend, you know, standing there. You have, I mean, it's just, it's a display of state power, the ultimate authority of state power, which is taking life. And it's, and it, it just, it, it should disturb all of us because when they kill people, we know that it's not just in the name of the state, but it's in our names. They say the people of Tennessee. So each of us have blood on us, yeah. you know, when that happens. And that's why, you know, we stand out there. And and, you and know, it's a murder. Like on paper, it's a homicide. It, yeah. It's not – that's the name that they call it. Yeah. So in our name, that's a very good point, and that makes it even all the more tragic, that in our name, the powers that be are murdering someone for – whether it's murder or rape or whatever, like they, you hurt someone else. Now we're going to hurt you exactly. in the ultimate way. Like I think about that as a parent all the time. And, and my wife and I have grown, well, my wife's amazing. She didn't grow in this. I've been growing in this where for a while I would get caught in these kind of, I have three kids and they're amazing, but they're kids, they're kids, which means that at certain times they're acting terribly. And I would yell at them to stop yelling at their sibling. <laughs> right? Yeah. Parents do it all the time. Or we don't spank our kids, but there would be, you know, we've heard story, we've seen it. And I grew up in that kind of a, you know, I grew up in a very abusive environment where it was, we're going to spank you. Mm. We're going to hurt you for hurting your sibling. Don't hit your brother. Now come here and get your punishment. I'm going to hit you. And we justify it because we're in charge. Mm. And we're doing in this death penalty, which is very a huge part of the a mass incarceration conversation is it's a power move. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. 
we can hurt you ultimately. And we're going to do it as a, as a, as a display to everyone else. Like don't mess with us. This is what awaits you if you do this versus, uh, redemption and restorative justice, as you called it. And that's not you, that's a conversation that's happening, but yeah. restorative justice, we go and we ultimately take their lives. The, the, the only thing they have left, right? We're, it goes back to the health conversation too. Like we're taking the only thing that they have away from them as a punishment, yeah. as the ultimate slap on the wrist for something they did instead of, it, yeah, it's, it makes no sense. And when we, we've been able to have some sort of like intersectionality around this discussion, um, talking to Brother Clay, uh, bro, excuse me, Brother Shane Claiborne, yeah. was, um, it's interesting. So one of the things I was at the legislature trying to challenge was the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the first grand wizard of the KKK, Confederate general, a white supremacist um, who's displayed in the Capitol. And it's so interesting to me that every time we would go up there to try and get him removed, you know, he's someone who massacred 300 surrendered black troops at Fort Pillow. Every lawmaker who supported his statue there would say the same thing. He redeemed himself. He changed his ways. And so I would question myself, why is redemption okay for this man? Yep. And you, yep. you would, in fact, give him a bust in the statue and honor him when he was a murderer. He did the most vile slavery, rape, all these things. And he's redeemed. But that same redemption does not extend to the people who you will go and kill by not abolishing the death penalty. Like, what is, where's the disconnect there? And they don't even feel the dissonance. No. It's just, I mean, that's no. that's what this is about, so. A couple more questions, and then we'll wrap up. One is, and, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I didn't ask you if I could ask this question, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. We have the uh, primary election coming up soon. Do you have a candidate that you're supporting, and why? And you don't have to answer it if you don't want yeah. to. Well, I haven't endorsed anyone, but I do believe, I'll say this, I, I believe that, that we can have radical revolutionary change and that we have to have that to respond to the crises that we're facing and that there are two members who are, who, who would represent that. Um, but I would say is that um, in Tennessee right now, we have this influx of Mike Bloomberg coming in and he's, I would mm. say, who not to vote for. I won't tell yeah. people who to there vote you for, go. but I'll say there who you not go. Let's to do vote that. for. And in fact, I was um, you know, told to leave Mike Bloomberg's event here at Woolworths in December, on December 19th, um, 2019, he was here, instead of being at the presidential debate, he was here in Nashville holding his opening of his office in Woolworths where the lunch counter sit-ins happened. And, and I wow. went to go listen to him and was told to leave because he said, um, we cannot be revolutionary, we have to be evolutionary. And so I looked at, you know, I raised my hand, I was sitting and standing in the front of the, of the crowd and I said, brother, you know, brother Mike, brother Bloomberg, do you know where you are? Do you know where you are in the very space where young people waged a revolution against Jim Crow? So when he says that, he 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 dis dishonors our history, dishonors the legacy of that space where young people literally sat down, were beaten, were told to slow down, were told to you know embrace incrementalism. But they were told that th these young people said, we cannot wait anymore. We've been waiting for years, and we believe that we as black people in this community deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And so I think it's interesting that um, that we have we have you know we we are the crossroads in America right now. Yeah. And it's going to take someone who's, you know, bold. And it's going to take not just a president, but it's going to take a Congress yep. that will also support yep. them. It's going to take a move and that will hold them accountable. So, yeah. So do not vote for Mike Bloomberg is the, is, is the answer <laughs> to that question. I totally agree. I just tweeted yesterday. I put my list of like, you know, based on who's left, because yeah. Andrew Yang was my candidate, like based on who's left, what's my order? And so I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then like did a bunch of spaces and then put like 5,736 would be Mike Bloomberg. Like it was like, yeah. Don't don't do it. Yeah, he's not he 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 is not a man for the people. That is clear. Again, if you want to know how somebody's going to act in the future, look what they've done in the past. Yeah, exactly. That's he has a very tainted record. He also has a record of doing. I mean, he's been a Democrat, he's been a Republican, he's been an Independent, and it's all based on what can he get out of it. And now we just have another uh, uh, alleged billionaire being replaced by a actual billionaire, but their behaviors are very similar. They both have, in fact, Bloomberg's got 60 plus allegations of sexual assault against him. He's got tons of all these like audio clips coming up that are just horrific, the things that he's saying. So anyway, yeah. um, and I hope people know, like, I'm, I just, I don't believe in telling people who to vote for. Like, I believe that they should have that. So that's why I didn't say it. But, um, the reason why I would say don't vote for Bloomberg is, is because, I mean, I, I just want to look at this even pastorally. He enacted real harm against people. There's people who were who are still affected by that stop yep. and frisk. Stop in and New frisk, York. yeah. And 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 it's just something that I think that you have a lot of our white liberal friends who say, well, you know, it had to happen, or like, you know, he's the only one who could beat Trump. And I just keep thinking to myself, it's like, 
that that's where we get this dangerous territory of the difference between white liberalism and liberation, where we don't just want to go back to things as normal before Trump because they weren't they weren't all that good. We no. we want a more just society, and that yep. I think I always think about what are we teaching our children? Where if you say only a billionaire can be can win. Our, our salvation only lies in money. Why do we even lo- teach them government and democracy and yep. all these things that we teach them? So yeah. I think we just have to analyze that. And, and you know, you can't go on YouTube in Tennessee right now or Instagram without seeing Bloomberg everywhere. Come up. And that should be a red flag to us. That's you know that that is not what democracy looks like. Just throwing money at a problem. And that's the other thing he told me. Um, he said, you know, I've done more for the climate crisis than you could ever dream. Literally told me this when he was at Woolworths. And it's, you know, like you have people who think that their wealth is the only solution to these issues. And, you know, I was reading Twitter today, Amazon CEO yeah. is, is giving I was money. about to say that. Yeah. yeah 10 billion to 10 the climate billion. crisis. If we had, if Amazon paid its fair sh- share in taxes, we wouldn't have to expect him to, to his charity, you know, like, so I think yep. that we, we have to stop this narrative of seeing billionaires as our savior. And again, if you, like I said before, if you want to know what somebody's doing in the future, look what they did in the past. Like this is a PR move for Jeff Bezos. Exactly. Like it, it, it's literally a PR move. It's not, it's not a. Um, there are some billionaires that are doing better than others, but it's not even other billionaires that I could name that you see a long term connection to these issues that they're really trying to, uh, you know, impact. This is a this is a PR move because last weekend he just bought his girlfriend a hundred fifty million dollar house, yeah. one of the most expensive homes in the world. Yeah. He bought. So it's like, listen, if you really if you really cared about the environment, if you really, these would be things that we'd be able to see a pattern over, over not just years, but decades. Because yeah. his, his his fame and his wealth is not something new. He didn't just fall into it yesterday. Yeah. And we see his patterns, and they're not they're not good. So, uh, man, I could talk with you forever. Maybe we'll do maybe after you're elected or, or further down in the <laughs> campaign, we'll uh, we'll do another one of these. But sure. <laughs> the the last question I want to ask you is: someday, many 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 years from now, you are going to die because that's in the cards for all of us. And for some odd reason at that time, I'm still around and they've asked me to give your eulogy. They've asked me to speak words of of uh, you know, love and care over your life and legacy to the people in the room. These are your constituents, your family, your friends, everybody's there to mourn and celebrate your life. In a few sentences, what am I saying on that day about your life and legacy? Wow, <laughs> never been asked this. Um... I hope that when it comes to that that moment, you're a minister, you know I was a minister. Yep. Um, I hope that people can say that um, that I tried, I did the best that I could with the time that I was given, that I lived my life like I was on a journey, and on that journey would sustain me, what I carried with me were the prayers of my ancestors, the, the prayers of my people, and that um, everything that I did was for generations that were yet unborn. Um, one of the things I've started doing, um, I don't have any children yet, but I, I started writing letters to my children mm. in this season. Um, I have some letters that I wrote to them. I started doing that when I was sitting in Senator Corker's office a couple years ago. I um, was sitting there just for seven hours. I said, you know, why am I here? I'm here for my children um, who are not yet born. But it's like amazing. I want to like I'm, I'm thinking about what type of world I want them to live in. And so I hope that um, they can say that everything that I did was for my children to have a better future. than this, you know, this chaos, this current crisis that we're facing, this trauma, this, you know, merely trying to survive, you know, it, it, it's, that is not a way to live. And so I hope that, you know, by that time things have changed and then I could be a small part of that change and that I was willing to put my body on the line because um, that's what I had to offer. I don't have lots of money. I don't have, you know, any things, but I have my body and I have my, my full being um, that I want to give to this. So, yeah. <laughs> Justin Jones, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, good luck on the campaign trail. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you're, you're awesome. You're an inspiration. Thank you for teaching us today. Thanks for having me on here. <laughs> A million thanks to Justin for joining me on the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope and know that you learned a lot from Justin today. If you have any questions or thoughts about this conversation, you can find me anywhere on the socials, at Nick Lapara or at Let's Give a Damn, and make sure to follow Justin at Brother Jones underscore. That's Brother Jones underscore on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to keep up with this campaign, whether you live in Nashville, Tennessee or not, follow justin.jones2020 on Instagram. Before we go, I want to thank the, the Russell Hotel in Nashville for letting us use their podcast studio to record this conversation. If you're ever in Nashville, you're looking for a place to stay, consider staying at the Russell. Their rooms are amazing, and your stay at the Russell will help the homeless community in Nashville. So they're very much aligned with the Let's Give a Damn podcast and what we're about. How, you ask? Through their Rooms for Rooms program. A portion of your stay 
will go to help several amazing organizations in Nashville do their work more effectively. That's a win-win for everyone. So please check them out at russellnashville.com. Okay, folks, that's it. I think I covered everything. As always, this show was created by Chad Snavely and me, and the music is by our friend Propaganda. Share this episode with people you like and with people you don't like. Just make sure you share it. It takes fewer than 15 seconds to hit that share button in your podcast app, copy the link, send it to a friend right now. Can't wait to spend time with you next week, friends. So much love and light to each one of you. Keep giving a damn. Peace. Peace.